as Aaron and Priscilla rekindle their relationship on the road home. The action picks up in the middle of the Matheson and Neville standoff. Neville wants to know whether Miles is willing to lay his life on the line for Monroe. That's when a twig snaps, allowing Miles and Rachels to escape. Neville and Jason are left to confront Doyle and a squad of Truman's patriots who pursue Miles only to wind up dead. The next day, a contemptuous Neville demands more men and a free hand, but Doyle refuses. Booting Truman out of his own office, Doyle lays into Neville. Even though the president spared him and Julia, Doyle will have their heads as soon as he finds Monroe. A week later, Miles and Rachel catch up with Monroe, Connor, Charlie, and Duncan's soldiers and retreat to an abandoned hydroelectric power plant. Miles fills Monroe in on Neville's quest to save his wife, then takes him to check out a new development. While stockpiling weapons, the Patriots have recruited all of Willoughby's youth for cadet training. Hearing a twig snap, the two men quickly flush two terrified escapees from the brush, Kim Carson and Dylan Matthews. At the safe house, Porter quickly recognizes the kids and knows something is wrong with them. Miles and Monroe discuss hitting the munitions dump, which will likely involve collateral damage. The town's children, rather than allow Monroe to interrogate their captives, Rachel and Porter eventually coax out some information. Kim claims all of Willoughby's kids enlisted of their own volition. Monroe gets feisty when Rachel and Porter arm themselves and prepare to take the kids home. Claiming that he will handle it, Miles puts Monroe off and heads out after the group. Little does everyone know, Neville and Jason are spying on the camp and scheming how to use trouble in paradise to their advantage. In the Oval Office, Roger Allenford tells President Davis that Willoughby's re-education center is up and running. Mincing no words, the President orders Allenford to take out Monroe and the Mathesons so the cadet's mission can begin. It is time to overthrow the commander of Texas, General Carver. And if Allenford is not with the program, the president is perfectly happy to shoot him, Doyle, and their families. Meanwhile, Neville visits Truman. Doyle is sending men after Monroe, but only Neville knows where he is. If Truman will give Neville the men needed to capture Monroe, Neville will back his play to control Willoughby. Truman flashes back to his time as a Guantanamo Bay prison guard in the months after the blackout. Just when things seem like they can't get any worse, the remnants of the US government appear in the harbor in the shabby fleet of warships. Kim's dad, Grant, aims his shotgun at Rachel and Porter when they show up at his door. Porter tries to explain something is very wrong with the training camp, but Grant believes Miles and his crew are terrorists, per the Patriots' propaganda. That's when Kim spills her guts, the Patriots blindfold the kids every night, and when they wake up in the morning none of them can remember what happened. Kim's black eye came from her time in camp. Grant takes a closer look, only to find a number tattooed inside her eyelid. When he repeats the number, Kim grabs the shotgun and shoots him in the back without blinking, then slits her own throat. At the hydro plant, Rachel examines Dylan, who also has a number tattooed on his eye socket, which sets everyone to argue over what to do with him. It is just the opportunity Neville needs to attack, during which Charlie comes face to face with Jason for the first time in months. Without hesitating, she knocks him out. During the chaos, Rachel unties Dylan and tells him to run, begging Miles not to shoot him. After beating on Neville, Monroe runs after Connor, who is being trounced by Jason. In the end, Miles covers everyone's escape. The next morning, Doyle rips Neville and Truman for their failure. It takes Truman back to Guantanamo, when he stood next to Allenford while Jack Davis proposed a coup to kill the vice president, the only senior US official left alive after the blackout. They will build a new America with new ideals, a new order for the ages. Davis mentions his assistant Randolph Flynn, as well as introduces Dodd consultant Victor Doyle, who makes a menacing promise to win hearts and minds. At a new safe house, Monroe scolds Miles for sparing Dylan. Monroe admits to wanting revenge for the destruction of Philadelphia, but Miles isn't clear on Monroe's motives. Miles is sure about Monroe trying to get the Republic back. Monroe doesn't deny it. He knows what he's fighting for, but it is Miles who does not. Back in Willoughby, Doyle orders Jason into his office. Pulling down his eyelid, Doyle invokes the power of the number tattooed there, then asks a hypnotized Jason to tell him everything about his father. With recruit Dylan back in the Patriot fold, Doyle and his men easily find Miles' safe house. Luckily, they have already decamped to an abandoned chemical factory, where tensions brew between Miles and Monroe. When Monroe insists they need to bring the fight to the Patriots, Miles accuses him of trying to win back his republic. Sick of the bickering, Porter states his intention to return to Willoughby to recruit help, and Miles decides to help. They are surprised to find most of the town has declared for the Patriots. What they can't know is that Neville is intent on becoming Truman's puppeteer. 
and is encouraging him to seize control of Willoughby from Victor Doyle. After their meeting, Neville is abducted by some soldiers on the street. With no quarter, Porter and Miles retreat to the bar, operated by Marion Riley, an old flame of Porter. Marion tries to run for it, but she is stopped by Miles. Once caught, she lays into Porter. She can't believe Porter teaming up with the crazy Mathesons whom the Patriots say are out to get Willoughby. Miles and Porter try to convince Marion that it is the Patriots who are out to get Willoughby by brainwashing the town's kids. The story of Kim Carson finally sways Marion, who agrees to hide the duo in her basement until she can get them out of town, just as Truman knocks on her door. Now Marion's fiance, Truman has come for dinner. Unfortunately, Miles' sword is in plain view in the bar. Miles is positive Marion will sell them out. Disgusted, Porter realizes that Miles is merely fighting against his own demons. No wonder he keeps losing. Upstairs, Marion serves Truman dinner, then asks about Kim Carson and her father and asks if he has seen them. No, he has not. That night on patrol, one of Duncan's men notices a temporary shelter of his fellow soldiers. A guy named Scanlan tells Monroe that the Patriots killed Duncan and many of her men. Scanlan has brought what's left of the tribe to join up with Monroe. Within minutes, Scanlan and Monroe have hatched a plan to hit the training camp, which Rachel knows will put the children of Willoughby under fire. Monroe doesn't care, and since Connor's going, Charlie's going too. Neville wakes up in Doyle's office, tied to a chair next to a badly beaten Jason. Doyle knows about Neville's plan to poison him, but Neville tries to foist blame onto Truman, then starts mouthing off. Doyle grabs Jason's head, pulling down his eyelid to display the number that made Jason tell him everything about Neville. Doyle takes off his belt and starts strangling Neville. That's when shots ring out Monroe and his men are attacking the camp. As Monroe relishes being back in his battlefield element, Neville strangles Doyle with his own belt, then escapes. Connor is stunned to see his father walking among the wounded patriots and finishing them off with a shot to the head. With four cadets missing, Monroe looks for intel and finds a notebook filled with Arabic writing. After dinner, Marion convinces Truman to go for a walk, which is when the first wagon load of wounded patriots wheels into town with news of Monroe's attack. When Marion spies a dead cadet, she tells Truman about the guys in her basement. Miles realizes something has gone wrong when the doors slam open, and Porter is shot in the chest. Unarmed, Miles fights his way out of the basement with a broken bottle, and hauls Porter back to the factory. There, he angrily punches Monroe for putting them at risk. But Monroe knows the townspeople never would have joined their fight. People do stupid, selfish things every time. That's when Scanlan hurries up with the translated notebook. The Patriots are sending the cadets to Austin to wipe out the Texas government. Meanwhile, Neville checks in with Truman, who quickly surmises it was Neville who killed Doyle. Neville advises him to tell Washington the truth. Doyle couldn't handle the terrorists, but Truman can. Following Doyle's murder, Jason is in a very bad mood. Neville wants to get back to tracking Monroe, but Jason is shaken to the core. The Patriots can make him do anything things he won't remember. Neville doesn't care, blinded by the only thing that is keeping him alive, killing Monroe in exchange for the life of his wife. Insisting his mother is dead, Jason begs his father for help, but his pleas fall on deaf ears so Jason walks to Miles' camp and puts a gun to Connor's head. Claiming this was his only way into the camp, Jason offers intel swipe from Truman's office. The surviving cadets are heading to 19 Arnell Street in Austin, Texas, and Jason needs to help stop them from executing their plan. Pulling down his eyelid, Jason shows off his number tattoo. Clearly, the Patriots have done terrible things to him. Since no one trusts Jason, he promises they can kill him if he steps out of line. Charlie is outraged when Monroe and Miles handcuff Jason and pack up for the trip to Austin. Rachel wants to know what Miles intends to do with the cadets when he finds them, but he won't answer. While Aaron sleeps, a zoned out Priscilla makes tea in a trance, then shoves her hand into the flames. But there's no pain and her hand heals immediately. Just then Aaron wakes up, smelling bacon. That night, Aaron asks Priscilla why she doesn't talk about her family anymore. Suddenly, she yanks him behind a log to hide while a slaver's caged wagon rolls by. There is no way Priscilla could have heard the wagon, so Aaron realizes she may not be the Priscilla he once knew. After watching Priscilla zone out all night long, Aaron confronts her. The Nano admits they are in control of Priscilla for the moment. Apparently, the real Priscilla decided to stay in 2014 and the Nana wants to use her body for a while, so they can experience what it is like to be human. If Aaron does what they say without telling anyone, he'll get Priscilla back eventually. There is a gun store at 19 Arnell Street, run by a woman. When Charlie claims she's looking for some out-of-town kids, the woman snarks that she and her companions can tell their deadbeat friends upstairs to pay their rent. 
Moments later, Jason is schooling Miles on how to avoid the booby traps that the cadet's room is certain to have. No one is home, but there is a scrap of paper with Arabic writing that indicates the cadets intend to hit Blanchard, an old friend of Miles and Monroe. General Frank Blanchard has a masochistic fetish that allows Miles and Monroe to approach when he's blindfolded and handcuffed to a bedpost. Charlie, Connor, and Jason stay behind at 19 Arnell Street. When Patriot Officer Baylor shows up, Jason chases him down and beats him in a fury, then ties him to a chair. Rather than answer questions about the cadets, Baylor tries to demoralize Jason, calling him nothing more than a blunt instrument, a hammer. Knowing that Baylor would have invoked his number if he knew it, Jason asks Charlie and Connor to take off his cuffs. Baylor's trying to manipulate Jason into killing him before he talks, but Jason is so much more than a hammer. Since Senator Wyman was just killed at point-blank range by a kid who then shot himself, Blanchard buys Miles and Monroe's story of murderous Patriot cadets. The kid who killed Wyman was carrying California papers, which means the Patriots are trying to start a war between Texas and California. Furious, Blanchard is determined to visit the president of Texas, General Carver, to persuade him to take the fight where it belongs, to the Patriots. Monroe salivates at the prospect of winning and can't understand why Miles seems so morose. Rachel did this to him. The guys are just enjoying the last of their whiskey when they hear screams from Blanchard's bedroom. One of his hookers has just stabbed him in the chest then killed herself. Miles and Monroe have just determined she's one of the Willoughby cadets when some Texas Rangers burst in, finding the two friends with blood on their hands. Rather than kill them or get captured, Monroe shoots out an oil lamp so they can run back to 19 Arnell Street. There, Jason has extracted some intel. The next target is President Carver, whom the cadets plan to hit that afternoon at the Capitol building during a public speech. Monroe wants to let it happen, but Miles knows such an assassination would incite war with California. Miles commends Jason for his good work and decides to let him walk around without handcuffs. Jason remains stoic, but Charlie knows that the night's events have taken their toll. Ranger Dove reports that Monroe is responsible for critically injuring Blanchard even though the Rangers believe they already killed Monroe. Sending Dove off to kill Monroe one way or another, Carver refuses to reschedule his speech. Miles' group shows up at the Capitol building to search for any suspicious-looking Willoughby cadets. The same woman from the store spots Jason and invokes his number with the help of another cadet and orders him to confess everything. She gives Jason a bag and orders him to act as backup. Spying Jason moving through the crowd in a daze, Charlie immediately senses there is something wrong. Just as Miles and Monroe spot Dylan, the Willoughby kid Miles spared per Rachel's request disguised as a ranger and standing next to the president. Charlie finds Jason assembling a sniper rifle on a high floor of an adjacent building and within moments he is choking her. The former lovers fight for their lives until Charlie gets hold of the rifle and tearfully begs Jason to snap out of it. When he charges her with a knife, she shoots him in the chest. The gunshot incites panic in the crowd below, and Dylan pulls out his gun. But before he can shoot Carver, Miles shoots the kid he once saved. The devastated Charlie wraps her arms around Jason and holds him until he crosses over. Miles and Monroe try to fight their way out of the square. Subscribe and hit that like button to help our channel grow. Turn the notifications on so you won't miss any of our new videos. Thanks for watching.